Good evening, folks. Just sending some invites. Hope you all have had a great week. Getting ready to get things started here in just a minute. Hope y'all been safe and happy. We will get things going here in just a minute. Hello to all my friends everyone from the United States and around the world that have been viewing. I really appreciate it. And tonight we've got a lot to talk about. This is Druid School lesson number nine. And tonight we talk about Philodect and the uh, Bardic Arts. The next and I think one of the most important parts of Druidry is the Bardic Virtues. So we're gonna love we've got a lot to talk about with that. All right. Well, before we get started, I encourage you to go and get yourself an adult beverage or whatever. Tonight we're drinking uh, sweet tea with lemon and a little bit of bourbon. Well, actually, it's a little bit more than a little bit of bourbon. Oh, yeah. But get yourself comfortable. Got a lot to talk about. And if you have any questions or any comments about what we talk about tonight, then please feel free to place one in the uh, chat section, and I'll do my best to answer them. And I hope everybody's doing good. And uh, before we get started, we are going to do like we always do. We're going to get the energy kind of uh, conducive to Druidic talk and, and the pagan situation this week. Um, I hope that you have been safe and doing okay in this uh, awkward time for the world. So let's just get that out of the way that I am just really, uh, every day I send out energy for everybody that needs it because this is indeed a stressful time. But before we get started, we're going to go ahead and do like we normally do at the beginning and end of a class session. We're going to take a little bit of a minute and we are going to kind of attune to things by sitting back, getting a little bit relaxed, and we are going to close our eyes, take three deep breaths, and we're going to chant the Awen and get into tonight's subject. Oh Oh May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. All right. Well, we've been just chugging right along. We've been doing so good here lately with a lot of classes, and we've been doing a lot of oak leaf discussions, and there's been a lot of new projects that are going to be, that have been coming out and are going to have more things coming out. And uh, one of the things that I always get questions about for people that are new to um, uh, Druidry is what is the gist behind the bards, the bardic 
the Bardic Arts, the Bardic portion of Druidic study, and uh, what you know, what are the things that we know about it um, today, its purposes and such. And one thing that I've noticed outside of those that are spiritually minded that study uh, for the Druidic side of things in various traditions and stuff, um, the Bardic Arts are one of the most studied <clears throat> portions of Druidry, bar none, compared to anything else. And tonight we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Philodect and the Bardic Arts and what Philodect is, is uh, sacred poetry sacred um, song working within that uh, mode of uh, uh, dealing with the ideas behind inspiration hello Judy good to have you here I am so glad that you that you have been able to join me for these last uh, few classes it's really cool I appreciate you and I look forward to having you here some more. Um, awesome. That is so cool. Uh, and Judy is from Australia. And I think that is just so cool that we can have the great big wide internet and have everything where we can come together and and just talk like this and just do the things that we do. Um, it's, it's very much exciting. So before we... Uh, get started I've got something I'd like to read to you guys and it just kinda gives you an idea of what this is all about and this is the song of Amergen I am a wind on the sea I am the wave of the sea I am the bull of seven battles I am the eagle on the rock I'm a flash from the sun I am the most beautiful of plants. I am a strong wild boar. I am a salmon in the water. I am a lake on the plain. I am the word of knowledge. I have the head of the spear in battle. I am the god that puts fire in the head. Who spreads light in the gathering on the hills? Who can tell the ages of the moon? Who can tell the place where the sun rests? I'm a stag of seven tines. I'm a wide flood on a plain. I'm a wind on the deep waters. I'm a shining tear on the sun. I'm a hawk on a cliff. I am fair among flowers. I am a god who sets the head of fire with smoke. I'm a battle waging spear. I am a salmon in the pool. I am a hill of poetry. I am a ruthless boar. I am the threatening noise of the sea. I am a wave of the sea. Who but I knows the secrets of the unhewn dolmen? And this is a little bit of mythology about this. While reciting the Song of Amergen, the poet by the same name, which means the birth of song, steps on the shores of Connemara Bay in Ireland for the first time, leading the men of Mill into battle against the Tuatha de Dé In his recitation of the mystical song, he calms the seas, allowing his warriors safe passage to defeat the fairy clan, which is the Tuatha. Whereupon he strikes the Tuatha de Dé into going. Uh, he tricks the Tuatha Dé Danann into going into the underworld where they reside in the Shees or fairy mounds. And this, the sovereignty of Ireland, is laid claim to. Thus, the song subsequently affirmed the sacredness and power of the land. It also implies a challenge to the gods in which the Tuatha Dé Danann are considered uh, to do not interfere and disrupt humanity. Amerigen is accepted into the realm of the mystics and joins the spirit of the cosmos, which commands the elements and holds court over the earth and, earth and sky. So, Amerigen was also known as Amerigen Whitney, and he was one of the first great 
Irish bards. And he is the kind of the forerunner of giving us bardic tradition um, and uh, the idea of philodict, which is sacred poetry and uh, so on and so forth. And there are some there are some clues about what are some of the uh, practices that are uh, kind of uh, sequential to um, druidic practice um, today. Um, as an example, there the the idea of sacred poetry and how it deals with uh, modern times was also brought to us by this famous writer, which is one of the most famous people in all of uh, Ireland, and is William Butler, William Butler Yeats, and his uh, writings, um, uh, especially The Stolen Child, are universal, but here's one that is maybe not as well known, but a, a, a tribute for us that we, for those of us that follow the Druidic path, and it's called Fergus and the Druid. Fergus, the whole day have I followed in the rocks, and you have changed and flowed from shape to shape. First as a raven, on whose ancient wings scarcely a feather lingered, then you seemed. A weasel moving on from stone to stone, and now at least you wear a human shape. A tiny gray man, half lost in gathering night. Druid. What would you, king of the red branch kings, be? Fergus, this would I say, most wise of king's souls. Young, subtle Conchobar sat close by me when I gave judgment, and his words were wise. And what to me was burden without end, to him seemed easy, so I had the crown upon his head to cast away my sorrow. What would you, king of the proud red branch kings? A king, and proud, and that is my despair. I feast amid my people on the hill, and pace the woods, and drive my chariot wheels in the white border of the murmuring, murmuring sea, and still I feel the crown upon my head. What would you, Fergus, be no more a king, but learn the dreaming wisdom that is yours? Look on my thin gray hair and hollow cheeks. And on these hands that may not lift the sword, This body trembling like a wind-blown reed, No woman's lovely, no woman's love me, No man has sought my help. A king is but a foolish laborer Who wastes his blood to be another's dream. Take, if you must, this little bag of dreams. Unloose the cord, and they will wrap you around. I see my life go drifting like a river, from change to change. I have been many things, a green drop in the surge, a gleam of light upon a sword, a fir tree on a hill, an old slave grinding at a heavy qualm, a king sitting upon a chair of gold, and of these things, which were wonderful and great, but now I have grown nothing. Knowing all, ah, druid, druid, how great webs of sorrow lay hidden in the small slate colored things. That is so cool. And that right there is just like just a couple of examples of the importance of poetry and song in. Uh, in uh, you know Druidic times, also we have something called the Cauldron of Poesy, and the Cauldron of Poesy is one of the most important uh, forms um, of uh, of like understanding yourself spiritually. And we're just going to give you a little bit of a a taste of what the cauldron of spoke poesy is. During the 7th century CE, an Irish filly, or sacred poet, composed a poem in one of the mysteries of the Irish wisdom traditions. This poem is preserved in 16th century manuscript, along with the glosses in 11th century language, 
explaining some of its more obscure references. When it was finally discovered by modern scholars, it was named the Cauldron of Poesy, for its reference to poetry being created in three internal cauldrons. Now, before we continue, do you remember when we were talking about the Dwia, the sacred elements? Well, as within and so without, or as within and so without, one of the things that we have, we have the cauldron of poesy within us, the cauldron of the head, the heart, and the groin. So that right there, that is a tie to us as spiritual beings that we contain the cauldron of poesy within us. Um, the early Irish fillet wore cloaks of bird's feathers called Tugan and were sometimes ecstatic hermits known as, known as Gelta, composing their poetry and seeking manic visions through various techniques involving incubatory uh, darkness, uh, liminal times or places such as dawn or dusk in doorways, and the ingestion of uh, raw substances such as the meat of sacrificed animals. Before we go any further, that is the uh, ritual of the tar face. The tar face is where uh, a, um, a um, bard or bardic student would be brought into a sacred grove, and they would be stripped naked and wrapped up within a uh, blanket made of bull hide, and it was basically the first um, uh, deprivation chamber. You would be placed inside this, and uh, you were given meat to chew, and with this, you would um, the the people that were there to attend you would keep a fire going until morning, and they would drum and sing and uh, recite mysteries to you while you went on this ecstatic journey, this darkness journey, while you chewed on this piece of meat. Also, like I've said before in classes, this is where we get the um, phrase chewing the fat. When you say you're just sitting there talking and you know having a conversation, we're chewing the fat. This is where that go that's where the that comes from. A lot of people don't know that that is how that comes about. Um, uh, the chewing or eating of raw flesh is apparently a link to the other world for spirits and the inhabitants of the she mounds are said to eat raw foods. By the 14th century, the filly were divide, divided into seven grades of achievement, requiring, requiring at least 12 years of study to attain the highest grades. During the eighth year of study, mantic and divinatory techniques began to be taught, and those capable of practicing were, uh, of them were known as Ola. The title is also still used in Ireland to denote a university professor. During the time of the Christianization of Ireland, the Druids were repressed or absorbed, and the Philae subsumed many of their social function and status in Ireland's uh, society. Philae were often associated with monasteries, and th their association was maintained until at least the 17th century, when the English began in earnest attempts to destroy the uh, to destroy Irish Catholicism. Um, this next bit is going to be parts of the uh, cauldron of poesy itself. My true cauldron of incubation. It has been taken from the gods, from the mysteries of the elemental abyss. A fitting discussion that enables one from one's uh, center that powers forth a terrifying stream of speech from the mouth. I am Amergen Whitney, pale of substance, gray of hair, accomplishing my incubation in proper poetic forms, in diverse color. The gods do not apportion to me the same to everyone, tipped, inverted, right side up, no knowledge, half knowledge, full knowledge for Eber and Dawn, the making of fearful poetry, vast, mighty draughts of death spells, in active voice, in passive silence, in the neutral balance between in the proper construction of rhyme 
in the way it narrates the path and functions of my cauldron. I sing of the cauldron of wisdom, which bestows the merit of every art through which treasure increases, which magnifies every common artisan, and which builds up each person through their gift. And right there, it's just, just that little bit from that poem, it shows that there is purpose in, in, in uh, the Bardic Arts, not just the uh, expression of art through song and poetry and things like that, but it's like whenever you look at it beyond just the uh, idea of uh, a type of juridic speech and a way of doing things, what it is is it binds everything together as an example. What I've talked about before in the very first class, very first lesson, is we learn that Druidry and Druids were very distinct in their places within Irish society. And one of the things that was important uh, in those times was the idea of the bards as lore keepers. So not only were they, uh, uh, you know, poets, but they were also those that remembered the lore of the battles, the lore of the great things that kings and chiefs of clans did. Um, they were also those that carried information from one clan to another, from one tribe to another, um, from the people to the king. And it was said that the bards could go through any area in wartime or peace unmolested because they were that important. And whenever we talk about the Awen, Imbus, uh, the, the idea of inspiration, the three rays, um, I believe that the bardic arts are the gatekeeping, the gatekeepers, the bards are the gatekeepers to, um, to Imbus, to inspiration. Um, whenever the poem talks about the fire in the head, that fire in the head is the inspiration that lets us do what we do, whether it's sing songs or create spells or create magic or whatever it is. Um, that is the thing that uh, uh, kind of like ties it all together. Um, and well, the one thing that I like about a lot of the lore and poetry is the idea that within themselves, if you really listen, if you really look, um, there are things that the poets tie to the the myth of the gods, the myth of the fae, uh, the myth of the deeds of the, the people that have lived through the centuries on the island of Ireland itself. So it's like if you really look, they tell you what was done. They tell you how to do it. Um, and here in a little bit towards the end, we're going to talk about, you know, we're, right now we're talking about the function and the way things are with in uh, the Bardic Arts. But here in just a little bit before the end of the night, we're going to talk about how do you bring that into your practice? Um, that, and, and how do you study it? And how do you uh, work it for what you want it to be and uh, one thing is I highly recommend that if you are looking for an author actually two authors um, uh, that I would look into um, is Erin Laurie Rowan and anything that she's done on Philodect I would highly recommend that you give those a read she's got several books that she's written and another one, surprisingly, is the Bardic Source Book, written by John Matthews. Um, it is incredible. It is a very, very good book. Um, it can still be found, I think, at various Barnes and Nobles, um, and can be ordered online. So they are findable out there. But I think that those are a couple of authors that are very good to uh, get a start and. Um, you know, figure out where you want to go with it. Another thing is within, we've talked about this the other night on uh, 
our oak leaves discussion, we were talking about druid orders, and one of the largest druid orders in the world that actually has classes that you can partake in and and courses that you can work through um, is the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, and they have an amazing uh, bardic course. Um, even though it, their philosophy of, of druidry may not fit what you practice, I still recommend that if you can, if you can afford it, take the course. I'm going to take the course eventually, but right now I just monetarily can't afford it. But it's one of those that I highly recommend. Um, and uh, so the Cauldron of Poesy um, kind of gives us what then is the root of poetry in every other it's uh, every other wisdom not hard three cauldrons are born in every person the cauldron of incubation the cauldron of motion and the cauldron of wisdom the cauldron of incubation is born upright in a person from the beginning it distributes wisdom to people in their youth the cauldron of motion however often turn uh, after turning increases that is to say it is born you are born with it tipped on its side and it rotates throughout your life the cauldron of wisdom is born on its lips upside down and it distributes uh, wisdom in every art besides and in addition to uh, poetry the cauldron of motion then in every other person is as to its like it is um, uh, it, it is on its own lips, uh, uh, kind of like a, a proportionate um, uh, distraction for ignorant people. It is side slanting in people of bard craft, and uh, and those that are prophets, um, they uh, they have a mid level poetry. It is on its back on the great streams, the highest poetic grades of great wisdom and poetry. On account of this, not every mid-level person, po person will have it on its back because the cauldron of motion must be turned by sorrow or joy. How many divisions of sorrow turn the cauldron of, so of, of the sages? Not hard. Four. Those things are longing, grief, the sorrows of jealousy, and the discipline of pilgrimage to holy places. It is internable that they are born through the cause of it of what it is from the inside and then there are three divisions of joy that turn the cauldron a bit of wisdom uh divine joy and there are two excuse me divine joy and human joy so just with that little bit right there that's where we get the inspiration as at these various times in our life the way that the cauldrons are turned within us um, uh, it, it, it can kind of uh, direct our path in the way that we work within a bar context. Um, also, we have, let me see, there's something that I wanted to, to put into that. Oh, also, as, as a um, side note for learning about the fire in the head, the inspiration that comes with Bardcraft and working in this realm of song and music and things like that. Another book that I highly recommend, um, I believe he passed away here a few years back, but there was a book that was written by a Llewellyn writer by the name of Tom Cowan, and the name of the book that I recommend uh, for everybody, it's a book called Fire in the Head, and it's got a red cover with Celtic knotwork uh, lettering for the word. And he talks about uh, uh, bardic arts and the idea of working as a bard and how inspiration can help you in uh, being a writer, a singer, songwriter, uh, uh, playing a musical instrument, um, anything that allows you to express um, uh, your, your bardic uh, tendencies and your bardic inspiration. Um, so, I mean, and I think one of the things that is um, really cool about the Bardic Arts is the fact that 
it lets us be creative. Now, I'm not saying that being a seer or a uh, druid priest doesn't afford you the same opportunities, but how many people here love music? How many people here love to write? How many out there with thumbs up and, and sending up some loves? How many out there enjoy writing? How many people enjoy writing poetry? How many people enjoy, uh, you know, listening to various types of, of Celtic and New Age and pagan music? It's kind of, I believe that the more enjoyment that you get from those things, I believe that it is, the easier it is for you to work within a bardic situation. Um, there are people that I have met and I've talked to that have no inclination. Uh, towards the bardic arts and that's cool everybody has their own uh, way of doing things which is cool but for those of us that have that love for um, for music and poetry and writing and and plays and stories and things like that um, it's what fuels us now I am one of those people that is uh, kind of unusual and that within Druidry, I like all three. I love the ideas of, hey, Aaron, all right, welcome, glad to have you with us tonight. We're talking about the Bardic Arts, and it's looking like it's getting ready to rain over here when I'm at, but that's quite fine, we'll be okay. Um, but for me, oh, that's fine, that's cool. Are you at home or are you at work work? If you're at work work, thumbs up for being able to even just listen. Thank you. Um, but uh, for me, it is the idea that I gravitate to all three. I like Druidic Ritual. Aaron will tell you that. I like the idea of uh, the Bardic Arts. I love poetry. I love stories. Um, I love books. I love literature I love to read it's I have more books than I know what to do with and I still got a lot of stuff on Kindle I think the other day just for the for the genres that I like to read on my Kindle I think I have just under 350 Kindle books and I haven't read them all but they're there for whenever I'm ready and then on the last part of that I love herbalism I love healing I love looking into the future I love working with, uh, you know, those parts magically. So I cover the whole gamut. Some people don't do that. They they just, you know, they focus in on a laser on one thing, and that's where they stay. But regardless of where you're at in that spectrum, um, uh, you know, it's like with Erin, I believe that she is very, very... Uh, uh, she's bardic. I believe that she is very, very people-oriented. It's like with some of the things that we've done for Belting in the Park and what she has done for the kids that we've had that are there. She's done uh, one year we had Belting in the Park where she brought uh, little planters and kids painted and, and planted flowers and, and things like that. And they had a blast it was so cool to see the little guys and little girls just, they had fun and it was, you know, it kind of showed them. That's the one thing I like is the idea that we can show our kids and, and each other uh, through different methods uh, the idea that, you know, the earth is important, the earth is sacred, and that everything that we do is a reflection of the gods. And stuff, and even letting little kids paint and uh, paint little cups, and then putting dirt and soil and uh, flowers in there uh, to take home. Um, a, it just made them happy as larks, and it just showed that they understood what was going on. And it's that's that's one thing right there. You don't have to be a great uh, orator, you don't have to play a harp, you don't have to be Clonod, you know, one of the greatest uh, Celtic bands out there. You just have to have that inspiration, and that's why Impus and the Awen and stuff is the driving force behind 
what druids do, what the bards do, and what the ovate seers do. Without that, we would be like a ship without a wind. We would be dead in the water. We would have no, we would have no movement. And holy crap, we've got 65 people here. Good to have you guys here tonight. I appreciate it so much. Um, we've been doing these classes for a while, and it just amazes me that people are just so cool that, that want to come and hang out and learn. But um, then we look at the ideas of uh, the way that the bards used to be, and they're, that they are still now. As an example, um, Bardcraft is very, very musical. We have a lot of people that are harpists that play Yulian pipes. We have people that play so many different kinds of instruments, Celtic and otherwise, that it is just unbelievable. Then we have those that are great writers of novellas and poetry and, and, and stories and all this other stuff. And then you have uh, those that are magical bards that write the song spells and the uh, loricas, which we'll talk about those in just a little bit. Um, and so many years ago, the idea of, uh, and this was in Ireland and Britain and Wales and Scotland, was the idea of the ice fatah, which is basically a coming together of those who practice the bardic arts and these years, it, it was, um, uh, uh, most recent years, it was a way of honoring the greatest bard among you. And the way that you did that is there was a competition, there would be uh, readings, there would be stories, there would be songs, there would be music, and the members of the greater body of bards would listen and kind of take it all in. And when they got done taking it all in, they would deliberate, and whoever uh, they thought had brought the most moving thing to their ears, to their eyes, to their mind, would be uh, crowned the uh, uh, the great bard for that year, for that season, for that ice baton. and. One thing that they did in ancient times that we do now is whenever that title was bestowed upon you, you were placed on something called the high seat. And the high seat goes between several different uh, pagan uh, traditions, uh, but actually the two main ones that uh, uh, utilize the high seat um, are uh, uh, Bardic Druidry, and uh, as a true in heathenism. And what the idea is that those that sit on the high seat because of the glory that they have brought to the bards before them, the high seat is that space where you are closer to the gods. You are the one at that time <clears throat> because of, of your, your greatness and the things that you have said and made known to the body before you that they were that they thought okay this is the guy that has the direct line to the gods and um, I think this is something that can be practiced um, by uh, any group I believe that the idea of uh, you know taking a smaller druidic order or body and having a, like uh, uh, bardic circles which a lot of groups here in the United States do that and what is a bardic circle it's where you come together in some place outside of town, out around a fire, and you recite poetry. You sing songs. You play instruments. You tell tales of the group. You do all this stuff. And the main thing that I think that is cool about the idea of having bardic circles is the idea that bardic circles serve many purposes. A, they are teaching elements. What they do is they teach you that the people that you are with at that time are important and that there are things that are worthy of remembering. Um, 
these are these are the people that were like the TV, the newscasters back in ancient times. And that was the way that you learned about what was going on. That's the same way with us now, even though I'm talking to you on a computer and stuff. Whenever I'm a, in, a, in a pagan situation, I try to push out everything of that is modern as much as I can. You know, there's times when we really can't, but, you know, keep it down to a core pagan thought process and whenever you're out there in those woods standing around that fire um, you're there with people that you love and that you care for and that you want to see grow spiritually as a group and a clan and a tribe so you sing the songs about the great times that you've had together you sing the songs that teach the stories of the earth and the earth mother and the gods and the underworld and the ancestors because if there are kids there with you they learn they soak that stuff in and that's one of the other things that's important is this is something that carries on this is a lineage um i believe that bards train other bards um that it is an important thing for to be able to do that so i believe that those practices um, are uh, important. Now, just as a little bit of a sidestep before we get uh, back into the main gist, okay, there are practices that would, uh, I don't know, other, other groups and other situations would probably look down upon us. As an example, and I've talked about this before, but we'll recap it, is the idea that between witches and druids, on the witches' side of things, with a lot of groups now you have the idea of and it harm none do what thou will well actually and it harm none do what thou will is part of thelemic law it comes from the book of the law okay so witches have taken that over time and adapted it to itself to themselves the first time that we heard this it was uh, recited by doreen valiente okay so we have that side of things and when you have, and it harm none, do what thou will, love is the law, love under will. That means that supposedly we would not do anything to hurt anybody. Uh, so that's, you know, and it harm none, do what thou will. As long as you're not intentionally doing something to usurp somebody's free will or to violate their body or any of these other things that it can mean, that's the deal with that. Okay. Then you go to the other side of the spectrum and you look at druidic practice and druidic philosophy. And it goes with this. In druidic practice and druidic philosophy, there is no and it harm none do what thou will. We are not bound by the Wiccan read because we're not Wiccan in that sense. And so that is something that is not on our radar. Okay. And another part for that of it not being on our radar is the idea that we can't be passive in protecting our family and our clan. So what that means is if something happens to my brother or my sister or somebody in my grove or the order or anybody I know or Aaron and her family or whatever, if I find out that something bad has happened, there is nothing that would stop me from working magic or doing anything spiritual that would be considered negative towards the other person. So that's where the Lorica comes in. Okay, a Lorica is a bardic form of a curse. Um, as an example, uh, you have two clans fighting and uh, they're down in a valley and you have two bards standing on a hill one on each side watching their clans down below about ready to engage in the fight of their life a uh the bards would stand on the hill and they would basically recite loricas and loricas are satires and satires in modern speak are the idea of taunting like uh if you've ever seen the movie uh, Monty Python that search for the Holy Grail when they come to the French castle and they are uh, taunted by the soldiers 
that's the same thing. Nanny, nanny boo boo. Uh, I fart in your general direction. Um, I'll throw a cow at you. That whole kind of thing. That's what a lorica is. There is no, there is no holding back in the idea of taking care of who you need and what you need to take care of. Now, on the opposite side of that, what I will say is druids just don't go around cursing people every day because that's the one thing of the idea of, yes, we have that ability. I'm a believer in how can you heal what you cannot, what you cannot curse. But on the other side of that, I'm a believer in you get what you pay for. So what that means, whether you're a bard or a druid or uh, ovate seer or a reconstructionist or whatever, whatever you say and whatever you do and whatever you put out to the world and the universe is going to come back to you in some fashion or form. Karma, call it whatever you will, but it's true. It's what happens is if you put out good things to people, 90% chance you're going to get something back. And it's not just an idea of expectation. It's facts. It's if you do good by people and you treat them fairly and you treat them with love and respect, that's what you're going to get. On the other side of it, if you, if you treat them with hate and despair and murder and envy and pain, that's what you're going to get. And I, you know, there are times that I can be vengeful about situations and things like that. That's human nature. But as far as making it a habit or being overly uh, uh, spiteful just because that's the kind of a person that I am in general, I'm not like that. I know people that have that greater tendency and stuff, but it just... You have to push. You have to push the wrong. You have to push the right button at the wrong time, forget to get me to do that. So what I'm saying is, if you're working in a bardic situation, whether you're creating a spell or a ritual or a meditation, or whatever, be mindful of what you're doing, um, because inspiration can work both ways. Inspiration can work for good, or inspiration, the imbus awen, can work for negativity. And that depends on where you want to take it. Um, so it's like, that's another thing. It's like you've got to be very mindful of how and why and where you do the things that you do. But I just wanted people to know that, you know, druids are not just white bearded, uh, white robe uh, pacifists that won't do anything. We do have that side where we will take care of ours. That's the clan side. That's the, the the warrior side of things. You know, it's not everything. Druids were not all uh, were not all pacifists and, and you know would just sit on our thumbs and and let people walk over them. Like I've said in past classes, Ireland was the only island that was never conquered by the Romans, and Ireland was the only one of the well not the only island, but one of the few islands that were cohabitative and friendly with the Vikings as they moved across the seas to conquer Greenland and Iceland. When the, the, the uh, Vikings came through Ireland, they liked, they liked our people. They liked the way that we were. They freaked out when they saw us naked, painted, in blue woad. They thought, whoa, what's up with these guys? But then they saw us in battle for various things. And they said, hey, you know, we want to trade with you. We want to uh, exchange ideas. We want to exchange, uh, you know, um, some of these, you know, some of these cultural things. And in Dublin and in Belfast, at the, a couple of the Irish universities, there are examples of Viking artwork, Viking uh, weapons, Viking armor, and things that were found in various places over the years in Ireland because basically Ireland became a refueling stop and a place for um, the Vikings to uh, do what they needed to to move onwards to do the things that they were looking for with Greenland and Iceland. And I think another thing is uh, if you are a student and you really like to study and see well, how some of these things mesh, 
is to look at some of the uh, like the poetic edis, the book of you know the 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 uh, uh, the Havamal and other uh, Viking texts and things, and then look at some of the lore um, in uh, the Tain uh, Bokolun um, and some of these other books. You'll see a lot of things that are similar. I think that some of the arts that the bards learned were tales and things and, and methods that were um, uh, brought along with them, with the, the Vikings. As an example, the high seat. The only difference between the high seat in a Viking sense and in the high seat uh, in the Druidic sense is I believe that the Vikings uh, uh, utilized it a little bit better. What I mean by utilized it a little bit better, there is a practice that has started to come back in uh, uh, as a true and van a true and uh, various focused circles that has been um, kind of revived by Diana Paxson. It's called Oracular Scythe, S-E-I-D-H. My pronunciation is horrible. But what that is is sitting on the high seat in a state of trance and looking into the future, looking towards the gods, whatever you want to do in that state, um, uh, uh, you know, you're looking forward uh, into the cosmos to see you're using it as a means of of like uh, for clairvoyance, for clairaudience, all these different things. And it is, uh, I think it's very cool. One of the things that it kind of ties is like, another thing is if you look at the various myths from around the world and not just the Irish side or the Viking side, as an example of the high seat and oracular scythe is the idea of the Oracle of Delphi. The Orphal of Delphi sat on a rock that was placed over a volcanic fissure, and that volcanic fissure erupted mists and uh, gases and various things that would erupt, and the Oracle of Delphi would breathe these things in, and whenever somebody would come with a question or a query, the uh, Oracle of Delphi would give knowledge and wisdom to those that came with questions and basically it was a enhanced form of uh, vision questing with a purpose that came about from inhaling these vapors and things that came from the crack in the, in the volcano and so you're looking all the way over here in the uh, uh, you know the Mediterranean uh, that part of the world and you hear that story and then you look at the, the, the processes of the high seat that were utilized by uh, the Vikings and by the Irish Celts. So there's a lot of similarities. That's the one thing. It's like, uh, for those of you I don't know how many here have, have had trouble over your lifetime for being pagan or magical or, you know, just inquiring about other spiritualities, okay? So... Whenever you have this situation of being pagan and living in a world that thinks that we're less than special, you get all of these things that will like my religion's better than yours and and all of this stuff. If you take it at face value, you know that's everybody's got one. That's their opinion. You know that's what they're going to say, and and you know it, it's either going to affect you and you're going to get down and think, well, oh, they're right. Maybe I'm not doing the right thing by studying this or doing that but just what I've told you tonight about the similarities between the Vikings and the Irish and then how that come about with the Oracle at Delphi which is in a whole nother region of the world it's the idea that we proclaim these different religious philosophies and structures but whenever you look at them and you really peel them down there is a lot more similarities than there is differences um, and I think the main thing that, uh, that we come away with is I'm one of those firm believers that, uh, religion or spiritual practice is like a diamond. It is, you have this one diamond and on that diamond, you have many facets, but 
all those facets are those different things that we call a religious or spiritual tradition and they're all interconnected for one thing and those facets all together are all they make up us you know there's not anything it, we are so bonded by all of these traditions diamond so far is one of the hardest substances known to man so it's very hard to uh, to to break apart and whenever you're looking at a diamond as a stone that has all of these facets then um, it kind of puts into perspective that you know you're on this one facet of that diamond but it's still all the same diamond for one thing and no f one facet is better than another they're all parts of the whole so we have Muslims we have Vedic we have dervishes we have Amish we have so many different things and all that those are are different facets of one diamond and that is humanity that is who we are and that's one thing that we can't you know we can't change those facets those facets will change as uh, the Lord the one way that a facet can change is if the lore and practices of a certain spiritual tradition are lost to uh, through uh, a loss of practitioners, through a loss of lore, through all of these things. There are traditions that have disappeared, and you know it may come back in, in another time, another lifetime. That some of these traditions may come back. But for right now, it's like we this is what we have, that one diamond. And so who am I to tell a Muslim that they're wrong or to tell a, a Rastafarian that they're wrong or to tell uh, the only thing that, that I will qualify that is my disdain for negativity. And on that is where I get into the idea of. I can't knock people for being Satanists because to me Satanism is just a perversion of Christianity but the one thing is if your Satanism um, how would I say it? if your Satanism promotes negativity to the point of harm I can't get behind that that's just something you may be on the diamond but that's not a facet that I'm gonna roll over to I'm not going to explore that I'm not going to look at it. I will acknowledge it, and I can do that. But as far as condoning the, the the possibilities and extremes of what Satanism can bring, because of the fact that it is bastardized uh, Christianity, and yes, there is non-theistic Satanism. I know that, but I'm talking about the roots of it before there was non-theistic Satanism. Um, so, but we'll get out of that. But I'm just saying that's just one part. Now, within that, every tradition has its bardic types. Uh, uh, As a true has uh, vidkis. You have various shamanic things that are, and yes, shamanism, Celtic shamanism, has bardic elements. Um, there, especially within spell work. Uh, now, mostly you would think the shamanistic side would be the ovate seers, those who who do the spells that work with the herbs that go into the future and stuff but there are processes like the tarp face and various scrying rituals and things that are equally as equally bardic as they are um, the ovate seer type of situation so now we start to look at we've got the ideas of philodect with it being sacred poetry bards and their functions within druidic society um, the idea that the bardic arts are some of the most studied within druidry today why because we like it we like to sing we like to write we like to play the guitar and the drums and the, the harp and all these other things so we've got this stuff right here as our base but a lot of people say okay well i'm studying and and, and doing all this other stuff how do i put it into practice how do i work with it well, one of the main things I think that that you can do um, is twofold. First, to to get that inspiration, 
I believe in meditation. And meditation can be simple or it can be complex. As simple or as complex as you want. But the focus of the meditation, um, for at least in, in this sense, I believe should be that you are, and this is a, this form of meditation is called lying in the stream bed of inspiration. And what lying in the stream bed of inspiration is, is meditation that allows you to say in your mind, let the inspiration of the gods and the awen and the imbus flow from the three rays and the gods and the ancestors into me. And as you're meditating, let the images and sights and sounds of that kind of uh, wash over you. And what's going to happen, you're going to feel many different sensations in your mind. You're going to have very many, you're going to have a lot of different thoughts um, that are going to come in. And this is where the inspiration happens. Those lightning bolts that start pounding you in the head with ideas. Ideas are the fruits of inspiration. Um, that's why I started following the pagan traditions. That's why I studied witchcraft. That's the reason why I, um, you know, started the studies of Druidry that I did and formed the Order of the Standing Oak and started to teach and to blog and to uh, do interviews with people that were important in the pagan movement and so on and so forth because that inspiration just kept hitting, you know, just striking the mark, hitting the bullseye every time. And one of the things that I think that you can do is as you lie in that stream bed of inspiration and you are meditating and it, you don't have to focus on anything. You can just say, just, you know, just let the ideas come. Just be quiet. Just be, you know, thoughtful of the situation. Just think on, just think on the three grays. Picture them in your mind and let that stuff come. Now, the one thing is, though, okay, so you're doing this meditation. You want bardic inspiration. You want the philodect, the, the, the ideas of your cauldron of motion, um, the cauldron of incubation, which causes these things to sprout and grow, whatever it is in your mind, whether you become a writer of a great book or a, uh, a writer of songs and all these different things. It always starts with a flash of one thing and then it expands. Well, our mind can only do so much. So the second part that goes with this is I recommend that you get a hardy and thick notebook. Hardback if you want, you know, whatever it's up to you, three ring binder or whatever, specifically for this purpose. And make it your bardic journal. And what that bardic journal becomes is where you write your ideas down. Um, the thoughts that you that you get during meditation um, and the other thing is we shouldn't just have to meditate to have ideas come sometimes ideas come on their own because we're listening and we're receptive to what the gods and the universe put out to us and some of those things are inspiration comes when you're walking in the forest Inspiration comes when you hear the sound of a thunderstorm and the rain hitting the ground. Inspiration comes when you hear a mother bird bringing food to her babies and you hear them cheeping up in their nests. Uh, inspiration can come in the laughter of a baby. Um, inspiration can come in the sound of your grandfather passed out in his recliner snoring after reading his newspaper. You've got so many things that are just triggers for inspiration that we need to be receptive to, open to. Because what that can do is give us ideas and inspiration for things, whether it be music, song, spell work, other meditations, helping people. Um, I believe that bards can help people. As an example, comedians, laughter is the best medicine. I believe that comedians are some of the best bards that we've ever had. Um, you know, sometimes we, we're so down and stressed and depressed with the way life is treating us 
that a comedian, someone that just tells a simple joke, something that makes us laugh. When you laugh for that couple of minutes, what that's doing is taking away the stress that you had before that. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to let it into your life. You don't have to let it eat at you. So for those of you out there that are funny, I appreciate you because we need more, excuse me, of you out there in the world. With the way things are now, a laugh can be life-saving to people because some people get so deep and so dark within themselves that at times they feel like they can't come out of it. And that's why the bardic arts are important because, you know, just sitting there and telling a funny story or a joke or, you know, just sitting there and, and talking to them in a happy mode, you know, showing them that you actually care, just letting the light of Imbus just shine through your demeanor, not actually trying, just being a good person is being a bard. Okay, so that is important too. Um, you know, how we put ourselves out there every day after we get up, we put our feet on the floor and we go out the door to do our jobs and do our things out there in the world. You know, we don't have to concentrate on being a bard. There's just times that it's on autopilot. And that's what I like about, you know, working within the Druid tradition is the fact that, you know, I put it on autopilot. That's why. We hold classes. That's why I've written blogs um, and, you know, done the things that I did on Blog Talk Radio with the Pagan community and teaching and all these different things is because I just, I want to share. I want to be a part of people's uh, lives and make it just a little bit better. If only for just a minute or two, you know, if something I says, if I, something I say, have said to somebody over the last 30 years that I've been involved in pagan practice has mattered or, or struck a chord or put them onto uh, a study or a book or whatever that changed their life or helped them in even the slightest bit. I feel good about that because then I know that I fulfilled one of what I think is one of the highest duties that pagans have, and that's taking care of each other and the planet. And if I do these things that I've been doing for however long and, and classes and just talking to people um, online and out in the world and stuff like that, just existing and being there when somebody needs you to be there, then you're the half, half the battle is won right there. It doesn't have to be this great occult mystery. It doesn't have to be all this complicated stuff, but... You know, it, it, it's like you can you can affect people's lives with with bardic arts. Um, another thing is the idea of whatever you do, do it as well as you can. As an example for that practice, um, if you have a musical instrument and you've just recently bought it and it's like you don't know how to play and you look at it one day and you go, oh, that's too hard. I don't know why I did that. I don't know why I bought that guitar or that flute or that, you know, harp or whatever. Don't give up. You know, go for, go as hard as you can. Take lessons. Uh, get somebody to teach you. There's ways that you can learn online. There's books that you can order. Videotapes. Um, language. Another thing is uh, learning a language can be bardic. An example, I'm trying to learn Gaelic, with Irish Gaelic, which is called Gwelga, for those who don't know the, 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 the proper term for it. But I'm not perfect at it. I've been studying bits and pieces and, and parts and, and things for the last 20 years or so. And I'm not even close to being completely conversational, but I have things that I can understand and I can put together for ritual, and I can put together for spell work, and I can put together for just writing in general, but that's something that I want to increase my knowledge in. So pick your specialty. Are you a singer? Then you could be a song a, a, a songwriter. If you're magical and you're a singer, you can concentrate on song spells. Song spells, which we talked about 
in another class on druidic magic is very important. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a breakdown of magical practices and the actual methods behind them in another class because we've talked about and given you the basic uh, bone forms of what they are, but we're going to go a little bit deeper and we're going to start talking and, and getting you prepared to work with these things so that you can find out if this is something that you gravitate towards, such as song spells and uh, poetry spells and these various things, because it is important for uh, what the Irish Celts have done um, over the years and what Druids are doing now. So we're going to get into that over various weeks and stuff ahead to kind of give you an idea of of how this works you know on that magical level because you know so far everything that we've talked about in our first eight classes by the way can you believe it this is class number nine and we're gonna keep on moving um, as far as we can we're gonna run it to the wheels fall off um, you know most things we've done is semantics and getting you prepared to you know figure the things out that you want to work with and so that's why we're starting with the bardic situation first and then our next not the next class that we engage in but our next section of this that we're going to deal with is the ovate seer the 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 working with herbs and and things like that working with looking into the future divination um trance and all these different things that kind of back it up I believe that all of these things go together in some form or another. So I believe that the Ovate Seers kind of enhance what bards can do, or bards that study the, the practices of the Ovate Seers can have, um, can have uh, uh, like co-functional places within Druidic, the Druidic framework and in Druidic society uh, as far as within the Celtic vein and things like that. As a matter of fact, just to kind of give you guys an idea, next class that we're going to talk about, we've done all of these things that we've talked about so far up to this class, um, is that we've dealt with, you know, the things on the human level. Um, we've dealt with the idea of the ancestors. We've dealt with the idea of Invis. Uh, we've dealt with... Uh, the ideas of the gods and the various festivals and things like that. What we're going to deal with next week for next Thursday's class is we're going to look at Celtic and Irish animism. The idea behind the animal and earth spirits, animal, earth, and plant spirits that were important to the Irish Celts as they uh, first inhabited um, Ireland itself uh, and some of these being uh, the boar, the hawk, the salmon, the fox, the bee, just so many different things because the lore that goes along with uh, each of these is important too because they are symbolic of various spiritual principles that are enmeshed through Celtic story and poetry and the, the mythology and history of the Celtic people. This is important. It shows um, what the historical uh, situation was with them even those many years ago. And the idea that uh, animism was very important too. Um, like as an example, we'll just give you a little precursor to that, is the idea that uh, the Celts believed in something called Anamkara, which is the Celtic oversoul. One life, many incarnations. And what that means is you start with that spark of existence and you ride it until the very end. And at the very end of that, uh, one thing, uh, one or, well, at the, if you go from the beginning to the end, what the end is, is eventually, uh, like I've said before, I believe that reincarnation is a vehicle in which a soul learns. It's all about learning and gaining knowledge and gaining insight into existence and lessons that have to be applied to our various lifetimes. So you've gone through this entire string of however many existences through the millennia 
what are we learning about? Why are we doing this? Because at the very end of that, it's where the universe says, aha, you figured it out. You know all that you need to know. And your reward for going through all of this, through these many incarnations, is the, is the idea that the universe will absorb your essence into itself. And for everyone that has reached that plateau in their existence, as from the Anamkara to that end, um, you become exal, absol, uh, absorbed into the universe and you become a part of everything. A book that will give you a better uh, understanding of this is the concept of the all, A-L-L. -L. And the book is called The Kybalion, a uh, book on hermetic philosophy by three initiates. And I have a little blue hardback cover. And it tells about the all that is, the all that uh, ever will be, and the all that is to come. And that's the kind of the, the, the back force that comes from the Anam Car, which is the Celtic Oversoul, that goes to that end point. When you cross the touch, you cross the, the, the goal line and you make that touchdown, and that touchdown is being absorbed into back into the universe. Well, a standard knowledge for that is the idea that I'm a human male and there are human females. So what we think in that vein is okay if you are a believer of uh if you are a believer in reincarnation the idea of whenever you return you will come back as a human you'll either be a human male or a human female with androidic philosophy and working with uh the animistic side of of reincarnation there is a term called transmigration and what transmigration is, is the idea that when a person dies, they do not necessarily reincarnate as a human male or a human female. There is the possibility of reincarnating as a stream, as a tree, as a duck, as a dog, whatever. Anything that is anything else, any other part of the earth, do you have that possibility to reincarnate as that to and and the reason why well why would anybody reincarnate other than what form that they are because it's how we learn how do we learn what a stream goes through over its life cycle but to know that a river cut off a spot and a stream started to dig its way through the earth and these various places and it started to go further and further down as that that water eroded more and more land mass to the point that it became this babbling brook that would you know meander its way through your town or through the woods that are on the edge of your town or in that natural uh, national forest that you may have visited it's all nature um, the idea of why would you come back as a stag why would you come back as a fox because I believe that with those it's an idea of the representations of the gods for some of those, like the Dagda was considered uh, a stag, uh, the white stag. Um, there are various things, um, various other gods and goddesses within the Tuatha that have animal representations. Okay, um, the idea of Boan. Boan was uh, uh, a, a god that a goddess that was pictured as a cow that had a bovine representation, uh, but it wasn't anything disparaging. It was the idea that the cow gave us life. It gave us meat and leather and milk. So it was a good thing. It was a pure thing that that that, that goddess, Boan, gave us good things um, through the idea of, you know, with that representation of the cow. Then you have representations of the salmon as being a bringer of knowledge. Uh, even the hazelnut, a little hazelnut from a tree, like we talked about, trees are very important. So it's possible that you could come back as a hazelnut. You could come back as the whole tree. There's nothing that says, and that's one thing, another reason why I like druidic practice, and that's the reason why we're having these classes, 
is the idea that it's anything's anything's possible. You know, it's nothing set in stone about what happens after we go through this life. You know, what is around the corner? What will be our next journey? We don't know. Um, as an example of that, also while I'm thinking, sometime down the future for an Oak Leaves um, get-together, which we're going to be doing another Oak Leaves uh, session, this, this Sunday is Oak Leaves 4, which I'll tell you about that here in a minute. But what we're going to do is we're going to take time and we're going to come together and we are going to do um, some aspecting. And aspecting is the magical means by taking our physical human form and aspecting either an animal or uh, a god or goddess or even a concept and basically transforming ourselves through trance and meditation and other techniques into that. That's what aspecting is. And that's a, a thing that the, the bards did. And uh, to a greater dis extent, that was what the Ovate Seers did. But the bards were, because they would aspect the raven when they told a story about the Morrigan, or they would aspect a stag when they told stories about the clan hunting to feed, you know, uh, feed their people over time. So they would magically aspect these animals to, you know, make a point with what they were telling you. So we're going to actually do that. We're going to go through and we're going to take and, uh, uh, you know, work through some of this and teach you how to do it yourself so that you can do it uh, at home and, you know, put some of these practices into practice for yourself. Holy crap, we've got 135 people. For, first off, before we go any further, can you guys hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. And to the people that are out there that have joined in just the last little bit, I appreciate you all for coming in tonight. I appreciate um, Judy Drew and Aaron and everybody else that has uh, been coming in. Um, so tonight, this was your introduction to the Bardic Arts. There's a lot here to unpack. Um, there's more. And like I've said, the two things that you really want to give yourself a chance to look into is any of the writings of Aaron Laurie Rowan. And the if you can get it, uh, you would also want to look into maybe purchasing a copy of the Bardic Source book written by John Matthews. Those are two biggies. And then uh, also another one that I highly recommend is a Llewellyn book. It's one of the few Llewellyn authors that I really vibe with. And that book is Fire in the Head. And that is written by Tom Cowan, C-O-W-A-N. And they are great for kind of giving you uh, uh, inspiration and introductions to what the Bardic uh, Arts are. Um, now to uh, kind of give you guys some information about what about what's going on. So we've got the next Oak Leaves. Oak Leaves 4 is going to be this Sunday at 7 p.m. And what I think we're going to do with that is we're going to talk about... Um, hmm. Because there's so many different topics that have come up here lately that I just... I think one thing is like this last one we talked about the modern druid movement. Um, I think one of the things that that can that we can discuss um, as far as the druidic discussions is how do we how do we move forward uh, as solitaries and for those that are with orders uh, moving forward, uh, you know that now that we know that this is the path that we want to walk on moving forward in the Druid movement what are the things that we need to focus on while we're here so that as we leave a legacy behind what is that legacy going to be is it going to be teaching the masses about the old ways the traditions the gods nature the goddess the earth mother these various things what is our focus going to be? What do you think our focus should be? Um, should we be more philanthropic? Should we be out there helping people more? 
teaching's fine, but if you don't get up and put it into practice and do the things that are important, helping society, helping um, the world be a better place, if you're not willing to do that, then you're grinding your wheels. You just, you're not getting any traction. You don't have the ability to put what you say that you know and what you are learning into action. It, you become like an armchair football coach, armchair football uh, quarterback. So that's another thing. Do we want to be out there, uh, you know, working for the good of the world more? And how do we do that? So we're going to be talking about that on this week's Oak Leaves 4. That's going to be Sunday at 7 p.m. And then uh, Druid School lesson number 10 is we're going to talk about, like I said just a few minutes ago, Celtic animism and Irish animism together and how that has uh, 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 affected druidic practice. We're going to talk about every Irish animal and plant and everything that is important and some of them that are there are myths and things that are important such as mistletoe and mandrake and all these different things because they all have their own lore. Some of it good some of it bad. We're going to debunk the myths about a lot of this and we're going to see about how that you can incorporate these into your practice. When to do these things. How to do these things. Uh, and kind of give you some sources of where you can go with that. Also, um, if you're out there and this is your first time uh, coming and checking out a Joy School class, I appreciate it. Um, the, the sponsorship of this is from myself and the Order of the Standing Oak here in Springfield, Missouri, and also being brought to you by the Missouri Druid School Facebook page here on Facebook. And if you are not a part of that Facebook page, I highly invite you to come and join us. Put in a request to join, and I will get you set up as, as quickly as I can. And we have some great people that have joined us recently. Judy and Aaron's been with us for a long time. She is wonderful. And we've just got so many other people that are participating and putting a lot out there every day um, that helps people to learn. You know, uh, some groups are, you know, just either they get inactive or they become very disjointed and disoriented in what they're doing, even on Facebook. And that's one thing I like about our group on, on, on Facebook, Missouri Druid School, is that we keep our stuff together, and it is a place where we can communicate with you. And like I talked about at the beginning of the class tonight, we've got some projects that are going on. And one project that I started here about a week ago, and I'm getting ready to release the next part of that, is what um, is called the Lore Keepers course. And what the Lord Keepers course is, is a course of Celtic studies that goes deeper than what we are talking about here in the Druid School classes. And the, the Lord Keepers course was developed by Celtic scholar and Druidic Celtic Reconstructionist author Alexei Kondriatov. And what it is, is it focuses on three tracks, history, language, and reconstruction. How do we work with the lore that we uh, are, are, are learning. And this is a deeper, more advanced type of Celtic studies. The first installment of that has been finished. The second installment, which will be the first lesson from the first track, which is history. That first track is who are the Celts? We're going to go into a deep dive of what the Celts are, more so than what we did at the beginning, which we did do in the beginning of, uh, this set of classes, which if you go on YouTube, and I highly recommend it, is go to A Pagan Perspective on YouTube and join the channel, you will find our very first class, and that is where we talked about who the Celts were and what they meant to the formation of Druidic thought as they came across the European landmass and ended up in Brittany and uh, Spain, France, Ireland, Scotland, that whole kind of thing. But this is going to go a little bit deeper. Um, then you've got the idea of language and how it affects Celtic studies and how important it is to 
Celtic Reconstructionist practices, Druidry, magic, that whole track. And then the last track, which is the lessons dealing with reconstruction on how we formulate it and piece it all together, looking at the ancient sides of these things, bringing it together and seeing how it functions within uh, our modern society. And there's a bunch of stuff in that too. And what this is, is I put these together with an audio and video track, put them together and put them on YouTube, which I highly recommend that you go to a pagan perspective on uh, youtube.com and join the channel because we've got a lot of stuff in there, rituals, meditations, but this is where we're going to post uh, the uh, uh, Lore Keepers course installments. And if you would like to be someone that gets those directly sent to you, then to become a part of the mailing list for that, all you got to do is message me here on Facebook and give me a generalized email address that uh, I can put you on the list. And uh, this next installment was today, Thursday. If everything goes right, I should be done and have it processed uh, by mid-Sunday afternoon just before we get ready for the next Oak Leaf uh, uh, discussions. And I will try to keep these, uh, you know, coming at various times. And then also by uh, getting into the uh, mailing list, at certain points during each tract of the Lore Keepers course, there are points where there are, uh, there will be PDFs that are made up with uh, multiple choice and essay questions that go over what has been taught in the last parts of the course. So it's like taking an actual course. And just to let you know, this is exactly uh, uh, free. Um, I claim no copyright to this. It is all Alexi Kondriotov and Imbus and those who put the course uh, in, in where it's at and stuff like that. So I claim nothing of that. But it's free and why I'm doing this is because it gives people access and another way to learn it for themselves. So you're not obligated to any kind of schedule. You can do it as you, as you will and take it. And I think that what we're doing here, giving you just the basic bare bones of juridic philosophy and things like that, and then taking the Lore Keeper course itself, it's a more thought out course than what I'm teaching. It goes into depth. So if you would like to be a part of that, message me here on Facebook and I will take your um, email, put it into the list. I will give you the first installment so you can see what that is. And then uh, Sunday or hopefully, if not Sunday, by Monday, I will have the next set into the list and have it sent out to everybody. Um, also here where I live, it's looking like that possibly for the next 10 days, we've got a lot of rain coming. So I ask to everybody that's out there to be safe and be careful because this weather has just been crazy with all the floods in Michigan. If you're from Michigan and you're watching this tonight, be safe, be careful because that flooding is horrible. Holy crap, we're almost at 175 people. Very cool. That is so good. I'm glad you guys are here. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Before we get ready to close this out, we're going to do like we always do. And we're going to take a minute and just kind of get the energy back to a decent level. Before we do that, I'm going to take a drink of this tea with tea with lemon and bourbon. Oh, man, that's so good. I wet the whistle just a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're kind of just bring everything back down to a more comfortable level. And... Uh, I hope you enjoyed the class tonight. Give me a thumbs up and love. Let me know that you're out there so that I can see that, you know, that you are uh, enjoyed the class tonight. Also, if you have class ideas, things that you would like to learn, because I'm just going down a certain track here, but if there are things that within your mind that you would like to learn, then feel free to message me or uh, what have you and let me know, hey, would you possibly talk about this and it can be about anything magical and whatever pertaining to druidry and I will do that also if you're just somebody that wants to have somebody to talk to things are just piling up 
and you're just not liking liking the way the situation is going in your neck of the woods, get a hold of me because anytime I'm available and I'll talk to you. I'll I'll do my best to help you in any way that I can. So having said that, I hope you guys have enjoyed everything tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to close the class out. We're going to get ourselves situated. We're going to close our eyes. And then we're going to take three deep breaths and we're going to chant the all in. May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. I'm going to take this, I'm going to process it, run it through my video uh, converter, and here in just a little while, this video will be up on YouTube so that you can watch it back for those that got in late. And for everybody that's here, I appreciate it. Judy, thank you for coming and hanging out. Aaron, don't work too hard at work. Be careful. Come by and see me. I've got mead waiting for you. Um, two extremely nice, cold, beautiful bottles of blueberry mead that I think you and the hubby would really like. But having said that, I hope you guys have a great night. Have a great week. Be safe. And I will see you guys Sunday night for Oak Leaves Discussions number four. And next Thursday for uh, Druidic, uh, Druid School Lesson 10, Celtic Animism, Irish Animism here for Druid School, and have a great week. Thanks, guys.